Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique, never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Thursday, everyone and welcome to Richard Skipper's Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. My show is all about celebrating. It's about celebrating life. It's about celebrating art. It's about celebrating artists. And I do believe that if we take the time to look, there's a lot to celebrate, even in these crazy times that we're living in. And I'd like to take a moment tonight to celebrate Jane Powell. Just before we went live tonight, I found out that she had transitioned. I'm not going to say that she's passed on because she's very much with us. If we think about her, if we believe that she's here, she's here. I'd like to think of her as being in the next room. And she's only a film away with Turner Classic Movies, the DVDs that I have on my shelf, and all of the great work that she's given us over the years. I think about the work that I do. And I'm all about celebrating artists and their body of worth. That's very much why I do what I do. I want to tell their stories. And that brings us to our very special guest tonight, Jen Donahue. I am so glad that she's here because I have been studying her. We first of all are meeting here tonight for the very first time. Although I have been studying her resume, I don't think that there is one area of show business uh, in her very short life that she has not touched base with. I mean, she is a director, she is a producer, she is a choreographer, she is a dancer, uh, she is an actress. Uh, she has done it all. And I want to ask her, when do you have time to sleep? <laughs> I don't sleep. <laughs> At least for the past few weeks, it's felt that way. <laughs> well, before we delve into your life, I want to ask you, first of all, how are you doing really in the midst of this crazy world that we are living in right now? I'm hanging in. You know, it's, it's, I know everyone has kind of taken this time differently. Um, and overall, I mean, I've been doing well, you know, I've, I feel fortunate that I've had work through this whole time. Um, fortunate that I was able to stay in New York. Um, my boyfriend and I were able to stay here. We just have an apartment for the two of us. We have space, so we weren't on top of each other. I know a lot of That's friends were, were dealing with that of like, we're in a one bedroom apartment or in a studio apartment and we're on top of each other. So we have space here and near parks. So I was able to get outside. Um, so overall, you know, there's been, there's been some highs and lows. Um, and I think the hardest thing that these past few weeks is I feel like all of us are ramping up now, you know, into that we were just all remote. And now it's this kind of hybrid of some things are are happening in person now. And and figuring out that balance is harder than I thought it was going to be. So you know, but not only is it the balance of everything coming back, but all of our friends are working again. And I feel that I want to be there to support them mm -hmm. because they haven't worked in the last year and a half plus, and I want to be there for them. And it's like every single night, someone's doing something mm -hmm. and I want to be there for them. I want to go back to, and then we're going to go way back, uh, <laughs> but uh, I want to go back to uh, March 12th um, last year mm -hmm. when everything shut down. What did your calendar look like when everything started to shut down? So I had a lot of work that was coming up. I, I, I think a lot of us, I felt like I had kind of hit a good stride and a good balance and all the different things that I was doing. And I had a lot of work um, that was coming up for the year that I was looking forward to. And at the time I was um, working in casting at a company, um, Mustard Lane, our, our affiliate company of Off The Lane. Um, and we started to feel that, 
everything shutting down sooner because we had all these events that were over the summer. And so, you know, word from Europe and some of our clients were overseas too. So we started hearing that trickle a lot earlier. So I feel like I had like a ramp up to like knowing like, okay, this is going to happen because all of our events are getting canceled. Um, so that, you know, like I was prepared for that um, in some sense, but then yeah, just everything kind of disappearing all at once when I felt like, I was like, oh, this year is gonna be my best year yet. And you know, it, it was a great year still, but it was just very different. <laughs> well, when did you first start uh, hearing about COVID? And did you have, I mean, none of us could have ever imagined uh, mm -hmm. that Broadway would be shut down for 16 yeah. months. Uh, and of course that meant theaters all across the country. Uh, but when did you first start hearing about COVID and what were your, first inclinations that the work that you had uh, on the hopper, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, would have to be put on hold? I mean, I, th I think it was probably February because that's when we were still casting stuff, but it was kind of like, there was this contingency of like, this might be canceled. They were, our clients were kind of looking into it. I don't think that I, I didn't expect it. I remember someone being like, should we go to the store? Should we stock up? And I'm like, oh no, like it's going to be fine. You know, I didn't, even though events were getting canceled, I didn't feel like it was going to be something that was going to last this mm -hmm. long. That's for sure. Now, I want to ask you, you're originally from Cincinnati, am I correct? Yes. Now, I have interviewed so <laughs> many people from Cincinnati. Really? Yes. What is it about Cincinnati <laughs> that so many great artists come from that area? Do you have, have you thought about that? Or are you, are you even aware of so many great artists that have come out of Cincinnati? I mean, I... I mean, CCM is there, so there's like, there's good, you know, Cincinnati Ballet. I mean, I grew up at a studio where we had, you know, some of our, our ballet teachers were from Cincinnati Ballet. So I, I do see that. It's interesting because none of them live there anymore though, right? So <laughs> maybe we felt inspired to get out. I don't know. Well, I want to show you, this is a picture of you. Um, there you are, uh, your first day of kindergarten. Uh, and I love this picture of you. I mean, because this is little Jen with so much hope and, you know, going out into the world. I always, I asked for this picture specifically. I wanted a picture of you uh, at five years old because that is a time in your life where there's so much promise. It's when you're starting out in life. Uh, it's before peer pressure uh, mm -hmm. gets added on and teachers start telling you what you should be or should not be. Um, Tell us a little bit about that little girl and who and what she wanted to be in the world and how you fit in. Obviously, that's your sister with you. Mm -hmm. um, that little girl was very shy. She um, she was uncomfortable talking in front of people. I mean, she was at home. I was very um, outspoken, I think, as I grew up. But at that age, I mean, all the way through, I would say, I waited until my scene, like my last year of college to take the communications class because I didn't want to talk in front of anybody. So <laughs> all, if, if you can imagine from five until like where I am now, where I am more comfortable talking in front of people. <laughs> um, yeah, she was quiet. She was very quiet. She played by the rules. Um, she was a hard worker. I don't know. Well, can you tell me a little bit about your parents? I mean, what did they do? Uh, were they in the business? I mean, what was it? When did that spark happen where you said, I want a career in the arts? Uh, so the dance studio that I grew up was actually um, owned by a, um, a high school friend of my dad. So that's why that's how we got into it. None of my my family is, is musical. You know, we had we always, you know, every holiday was like playing. We would watch The Music Man or White Christmas. We were always singing. We had, you know, I was in choir growing up. My cousin was as well. My um my dad and my grandfather, they played instruments, but no one was a dancer that I can recall. <laughs> um, so that was kind of something new. And I, and you know, until I was probably in high school, it wasn't something, it was something that I always did. Um, and then started like 13, like probably 11, I started assisting classes. And at 13, 14, I was teaching uh, my own classes, um, to little kids at that age. Um, but I think, all throughout high school, there was nothing else. You know, I was a good student. I was, had over a 4.0. Um, I obviously excelled in my classes elsewhere, but I really, my poor mom, I think she's probably watching right now. Like she was like forcing like college applications on me. I had no, like, I did not know what I wanted to do. And I was not motivated to like 
even apply for colleges. Dance was like really the only thing that I was like, oh, well, I should do this because it's the only thing that even makes sense to me right now. Um, well, do you have any recollection of what it was that forced you, if you were that shy kid and you are teaching other kids to dance, obviously mm -hmm. you were trying to force those kids to be in the spotlight somewhat. Um, what was the motivation that got you uh, to move through your shyness to get those kids into the spotlight? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, yeah, the teaching was always something that was, it was, it was helping other, yeah, you're totally right. I've never really thought about that in a <laughs> sense before. I'm like, oh, wow, yeah, okay, now we're like digging in here. Um, because I was so shy and that dance was something that I felt comfortable, you know, doing, um, expressing myself in that way, even though I wasn't comfortable, you know, speaking in front of people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's um, also, I mean, as a dancer, I mean, when you're, most people, if you're not in the business, you probably don't realize this, but when you're on that stage and there are lights in you, there is a wall of light that mm -hmm. you're not really seeing the audience. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel comfortable with that wall of light there as well? I, I guess I never really thought thought of it as even a separation. It just felt like I wasn't myself. You know, I was somebody else. I was always, I, I loved playing, you know, even as a dancer before I started getting into theater of just like figuring out who that character was, like what, who was I? Like what, what did this piece mean? What did, you know, so getting into that. So I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't myself and I was somebody else doing this thing. And so it kind of felt like a separation for me. Um, from who I was like personally, and then like this dancer, actor version of myself. <laughs> so what it was dance that uh, propelled you forward um, in the business? Yeah, that's how I started out. I mean, I took, you know, I grew up taking, well, I didn't take it for very long because I wanted to sing during my piano lessons. I was like, I don't want to practice piano. I just want to sing the songs. Um, but I grew up in choir and things like that. And I did mm -hmm. theater my, my, um, senior year of high school but dance was so all-consuming i was in i was teaching i was taking class um i think i was there like six sometimes seven days a week at the dance studio so it was really that was what i was a dance performance major at ball state um and then i realized you know after i graduated college when i moved to chicago um after i, I spent one contract dance on a cruise ship um when I got to Chicago, I was doing gigs here and there. And I was like, I want to be doing theater. What am I doing? And so I like <laughs> got into voice lessons and um, acting classes and, and started pursuing theater. Now, is it just you and your sister or do you have other siblings as well? I have a half brother, an older half brother. He's 11 years older. Okay. And Doctor, and not do in the either, business. <laughs> do either of them have the same uh, desire to be in the business that you do? Or are they in the business? My, no, my brother is, um, he's a radiologist. My sister's a pharmacist. My sister and I grew up dancing together. She was an incredible dancer. She was honestly better than I was growing up. She had like the, per she had just like the perfect body and she was gymnastics as well. Like she was, she was beautiful. Um, but she's a pharmacist now, very successful pharmacist in Indianapolis. Good for her and good yeah. for your brother as well. God bless them and what they yeah. do. Yes, yes, exactly. So, so you, you, Went to Chicago. I mean, I always say that there are two um, routes that people take in this business. One is either New York or Los Angeles, but there's also Chicago. And did you have a lot of opportunities in Chicago? I did, yeah. I felt it was, um, so right after college, I did a, like I said, I did a contract on a cruise ship and we did a takeout show. So it was, a, you know, we got to work with the choreographers and a lot of the choreographers were based in Chicago. So I knew, it felt safe. I knew I wanted to end up in New York City, but it felt like a safe step for me to go through Chicago on the way to New York. Um, and so I was able to work with a couple of different um, talent uh, production companies doing like a lot of showgirl gigs or just co like corporate industrial type things for mm -hmm. a few years. Um, and then I got my equity card in Chicago. Um, so I was able, I did one show at a non-equity theater and then I did a few shows at Chicago Shakes and theater, theater at the center. Um, and got my equity card before I moved to New York, which I felt for me, I, I needed to get. Um, so, so what was the show that you got your equity card for? A Christmas Carol. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What role? A uh, ghost of a uh, Christmas future. Okay. So when you got your equity card, I mean, I have a very interesting story, I'll, which I'll share with you at another time. I almost got my equity card with a Christmas Carol. Oh. And as I was leading up to get that, I got very, very sick. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't able to. 
it was a it was a heartbreaker for me. Yeah. Uh, but I did eventually get my equity card, so that was that was great. But when you were leading up, was the equity card for you a holy grail item for you? Was this something that you felt I have to have my equity card? I felt. I think I felt for, you know, I'd gone to New York a few times um, before I moved and went on an audition and things. And I just felt like if I'm going to maximize my time, I, you know, when I got my card, I was in my mid to late 20s. So I was like, if I'm going to maximize my time mm -hmm. um, in New York, I need to be seen. You know, I need to be seen at the auditions. And, you know, at the time it was just, it was, you know, it's like sitting around for hours and not even know if you're going to be seen. So I was like, I need to know if I'm going to be seen. Um, so just to maximize my, you know, my time, because I'm like, I have to make money. I gotta, gotta do this. I have a question about that. Where did that knowledge come from? Because there are so many people that come to New York who don't have that knowledge. Um, did, where did you know that you had to have that coming into New York? Was this based on things that you had heard in Chicago or was it was just something that you heard through the grapevine? Where did that knowledge come from for you? I guess it was just in, pa I mean, it was an experience, right? So it was me going to New York, not having my equity card and being like, oh my gosh, okay. I'm sitting here for hours and I didn't get seen. Where'd my whole day go? And just thinking like, I'm always like about efficiency. So I'm like, how am I going to make money if I'm sitting here for, you know, it's like, I got to make, I got to pay rent, you know? So, and then I had, you know, I had friends in Chicago that were like, well, if you stay in Chicago, you don't want to get your equity card because you'll get more um, opportunities um, with the contracts there. They don't, they don't, they don't offer as many equity contracts. So it's like you'll have more opportunities to perform if you don't have your equity card in Chicago, but in New York, it's the, I'm going to sit and maybe get seen, maybe not get seen. So mm -hmm. um, I think well, I just I want to go back to that for a moment. So when you came to New York the first time, you didn't have your equity card. Am I correct? When I came to visit, I did not. No. Okay. So when you came here to live, you did have your equity card. I did. Um, where did you live when you first came to New York? And did you come here with a job or did you get a job after you got here? So I was, you know, about feeling safe and making sure that, you know, just planning you ahead. So I kept, efficiency. <laughs> I am. So I kept my apartment in Chicago because I was like, I just want to test out New York and see if it's a good fit. And I had, I, a friend of mine had been working at Ballet Academy East for years and years. And she's like, look, I can get you on as like a lead camp counselor for the summer program. Um, you know, so at least, you know, you have work while you're here. And I got a sublet um, on, what was it? 158th and Fort Wash, 159th and Fort Wash. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I was like, okay, great. I know I still have my apartment in Chicago. So it's like a safety net, you know, if I need to go back, but I have this job, it'll like, it's not going to pay a ton, but it's going to get me to New York. Um, and within two weeks of being there, you know, it was like the middle of July. It stunk. It was hot. It was sticky. And I was like, I love it. I want to be here. So um, from there, I I think I moved sublets like I don't even know. It was like 160th in Fort Wash. Then it was I think I moved my sublets before I got my apartment like five more times before I moved into the apartment that I'm in now. I You're slept on the nice floor stuff. like. <laughs> Yep, I had the whole in that one that first year of living here, that whole New York experience of like sleeping on the floor, living in all these like roach infested, fly infested places, you know. And then I've been in this place since 2013, and I love it. Oh, that's <laughs> so. great. And what kept you going? What I mean, what was the impetus that just you knew that you were going to just keep going against all odds here in New York? Because it is a tough town, especially, did you have a lot of friends here? Did you have a good um, support base or were you making that as you go along? Uh, what kept you going? I, I did, um, I did have friends here. I mean, like I said, my friend got me the job and she was my roommate in college. And I had a lot of friends because I worked on cruise ships and I'd done gigs overseas. Like I had friends that were in this, you know, in the city. So I did feel like I had a community already. And actually, funny story, the first day that I moved to New York, within the first four hours that I was here, I ran into four different friends, like one at a dance class, one at an audition, one on the like on the train, then going up the elevator at 168th. <laughs> I'm like, okay, there's signs, like I'm supposed to be here, you know. <laughs> so I think just that that sense of community when I first got here was was really helpful. And then actually um within probably about 
a month and a half of moving here. So our affiliate company of Off the Lane Mustard Lane, um, she brought me in for an interview, and that that working with that company also gave me a real community and network of people of like-minded artists um, mm -hmm. that were you know working and doing side gigs that really helps you know. Now, did you have any survival jobs or have you always worked in the theater since you've been here? Yes. I mean, I have, I mean, yes, I have had survival. I worked for a catering company for a couple of years on and off. Um, and then Mustard Lane with the, I did brand ambassador work. And then I also did casting for three and a half, four years. Um, again, it was in between, but I was able to kind of, you know, just kind of make it all work together as we do the hustle of just, but I didn't have to have like a restaurant job or anything that I knew when I was living in Chicago, I did that for two months and I was like, that's not for me. I'm like a gig pickup to make sure that I have flexibility to make sure I'm pursuing, you know, the career that I want to be pursuing. So now coming to New York with your equity card at the time that you came and at the age that you were, was that a blessing or was it a curse for you at that time? You know, it's interesting when I, when I got here with the equity card, I was auditioning. I was I was enjoying that, but I was like, I very quickly, probably within the first year that I was here, I started getting recommended um, like through um, different people that I'd worked with for like associate choreographer gigs or associate director gigs. And I realized very quickly that I really love being on the other side of the table. So it was a, a pretty quick transition for me. Um, and, and I, you know, a lot of people, a lot of my friends have been like, they have like making peace with it. I was actually like 100% okay switching to the other side of the table. And I, I love it. You know, I, I think I mentioned before, you know, I started teaching when I was and assisting when I was 11. So it's always been a part of like who I am is, is working like on that. And I think it just, you know, being able to have the experience of like, you know, I've been on both sides of it. So, and I just love seeing everything come together. I love mm -hmm. collaborating with people. Um, I love, you know, just being in the trenches with uh, with other artists mm -hmm. and like making it all come together <laughs> for opening night. <laughs> well, I, I want to ask you about um, ambition in your life. Um, mm -hmm. How ambitious are you on the scale of one to ten? And do you have, do you have a plan that you have mapped out in terms of the way that you're pursuing your career, um, or uh, has it been falling into place? based on the opportunities that have come your way and the people that you've known and gotten to meet along the way? Yeah, I think it's the latter. I mean, I I am, you know, in my work ethic, I am ambitious. I put 150% into everything that I'm doing, probably to my detriment, but <laughs> um, I have been I have been lucky. It's, well, you know, Sarah every Anderson says you're a 10. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, you know, it's every time, even during this past year, I was like, all right, I need to go in and revamp my website. And right as I was doing that, you know, someone reached out um, for something that I'd worked with before. And I, I do think that I've been very fortunate, like the people that I've worked with, you know, I, I love working with them. I love collaborating with them. Um, and thankfully they've had work. So it's mm -hmm. like, it's, it hasn't, I haven't had to um, struggle as much of, of opportunities coming along, which I'm very grateful for, which I, I I don't know why that's happening, mm -hmm. but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> but Sarah also says you do it with grace, and that's great. <laughs> you know, so, but you know, I love the fact that uh, that you are very much aware of who you are. Um, the fact that you are very comfortable on both sides of the aisle, um, and I love that as well. I too am comfortable on both sides of the aisle, um, and I think that if more artists um, would be comfortable on both sides of the aisle, mm -hmm. um, that they will get a, a greater sense of who they are as mm. artists in this business yeah. because so many people don't realize um, all of the other jobs that it takes to make mm -hmm. uh, someone shine in the spotlight. And it's not always just about being that person on that, you know, in the spotlight on stage. It's that entire village that it takes for that to happen. 100%. So now I want to talk about off the lane yes. um, and how this all came together your mission and the work that you are doing with them and how you got involved with them. Sure, yeah, so I mentioned before Mustard Lane, which is um, our affiliate company. And I think, gosh, when was that? I think it was in the spring of 2018. 
um, had this idea of holding monthly socials for our community of artists. So, you know, Crystal, um, our president of Off the Lane, um, started Mustard Lane with the idea of providing side gigs for artists, you know, so we, as a casting director for them, I was hiring artists all over the country and even in Canada as well. Um, and so we have this big community of artists. And so I was like, we need to get together. And like, we decided to donate to a different charity each month. It was a different theme each month, but it was just a way for us to get together off of the lane. Um, and we started having these conversations. Crystal had, you know, had this idea of starting a nonprofit. And we started having conversations like what, you know, what does, how can we help out our artist community? And the thing that it kept coming back to was those first years in a new city and what that is like and how it would have been great if we'd had someone to, to guide us through <laughs> through those those first couple of, of years so we we dove in um got a you know nonprofit for dummies book and was reading up i was like on a cruise ship at a, on a gig and i was like you know at night i'm like reading up i'm like all right how do we write our bylaws and you know trying to do all this stuff and we got our nonprofit status in um 2019 and the first program that we developed was our mentorship program so that was you know that one has it's been incredible it started it's so crazy but our first our first session was on in March, March 1st of 2020. So it started before, you know, we've been doing all this outreach. It always planned to be a, a virtual program because we were connecting um, college juniors and seniors with New York professionals. So they were always gonna be doing something on, you know, Skype or FaceTime or now Zoom, which wasn't a thing really <laughs> when we started this. Um, well, how do people find out about you? I, I found out about you through Cynthia Darlow. Mm -hmm. um, she, I've interviewed her because of the work that she's doing with the rehearsal club. Mm -hmm. And she says, you have to talk to Jen Dunahoo. Mm -hmm. And here we are. So, uh, but how are people finding out about you? And, and I think that's a great idea because how wonderful it would have been if I had known about an organization like you when I first came to New York and I came to New York in 1979, mm -hmm. uh, you weren't even around. <laughs> um, and it was a very different animal uh, than what it is now. Um, and it was quite a scary city to come to at that time. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, so we've been kind of trial and error about how to get the word out there. It was reaching out literally of compiling, doing the research and compiling a list of every single college university that had a theater program or musical theater or dance program and just cold emailing. And that's how we got our first, um, for our first session, it was three mentees. And then two weeks later, everything shuts down and we're like, oh my gosh, we really need this right now. Let's do another round of outreach. And because of what was going on, we got more interest um, from professors being like, oh yeah, like we need help to like help transit, you know, it's like they, so we had four, we did a kind of an in-between session. We had four mentees. And then from there, it just kept growing that summer. We had 10, we had 19 in the fall of last year. We had we capped it at 25 um, earlier this year, and then we have about uh, 18 going through the program right now. Um, and now it's gotten to a point where most of it's word of mouth. We send out, you know, an email to, um, you know, be one round of emails to people that have gone through, but it's it's definitely word of mouth, which is really exciting. Um, Are you doing a lot of your work now virtually now because of COVID? Is that where yes. most people are finding out about you? Yeah, everything's. I'm working out of my apartment. <laughs> So all remote. Yeah. And our other programs that we've been developing, um, our boost program as well. Um, our boost co-chairs have been working. These are with, um, people that have been in New York for a few years. Um, it's kind of a, they're called, like career therapy in a way of just like kind of refocusing and like helping boost where they are in their career. And so they've been meeting with their boosters, um, remotely. Um, we actually just had, um, two weeks ago, we, had um, some B-roll filming for our fundraiser, um, our Empower Artist fundraiser that's on November 8th. Um, and we got to meet some of our boosters and mentees in person for the first time. We're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's just fun to meet them like in real life. <laughs> well, I was reading a great book this morning uh, called uh, My Morning Routine. And it's mm. all these great, famous people, you know, throughout history and their morning routine. Mm. I wanna know what your morning routine is. Okay. Um, it, it's it changes. I mix it up, but my 
unfortunately, my morning routine is checking my email right when I wake up. Um, then I drink some water and then I make, um, I always, I love to have peaches and kiwi and oatmeal for breakfast. So that's like my first thing that I do. And again, probably to my detriment, I, I eat it while I'm checking my email and like figuring out what my day looks like. Um, and then sometimes I'll write, I, I keep a journal, I moved it to the, the living room today, but I keep a journal by my bed. So if I, if I have any thoughts um, that I just wanna get off my chest mm -hmm. first thing in the morning, I will all just kind of scribble, like it might be just a sentence, it might be a poem. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes that's in my morning routine, but I'm all about breakfast. I have to have breakfast right when I get up, otherwise my day is a failure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, what are your goals with uh, with you personally in terms of where you would like to see your own career go? Um, do you want to continue on with um, uh, Off the Lane? And where do you want to see the organization move to? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something I, I think about almost on like a weekly basis of where, because the work that I've done, the other work that I do is, is so, everything's just so different. It's all, you know, kind of the same. It's organizing people and, you know, it's like producing and logistics and all this kind of stuff. And it's all, you know, kind of the same thing, but like in different mediums, which mm -hmm. is exciting because it's still like creative. Um, I want to keep doing more of that for sure. Um, I like having different, things happening. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't like for things to be static or stagnant. Um, I like new energy and new collaborators. So what's been really exciting um, with Off the Lane is that, you know, through the development of our different programs, like it has been something new. It's like, okay, let's, let's figure out what this, you know, like how we can develop this and like, oh, that's not working. Let's try something different, um, which has been really fun. And, and this year, especially like I'm so grateful we we launched the Anne Ranking Scholarship Program and right now we are um, we're in our tier two of adjudication. Um, our winner for the inaugural year will be um, announced at our at our fundraiser and it's been really great to, to fold in some amazing mm -hmm. collaborators with our um, advisory board and just getting to work with them has been really, really incredible. Um, like I said, I love collaboration. I love working with new people. Well, so. you know, it's so funny. You and I, I'm sending you telepathic messages right <laughs> now because my next question that I was going to ask you is about collaboration because I'm all about collaboration. And I want to ask you, who are some of the great collaborators uh, mm. that you have worked with in your career? And I'm not uh, talking necessarily about the mentors because we're going to get to that in a moment. But people that you've collaborated with who you feel have truly moved you to the next level. Uh, your career? Gosh, I mean, honestly, every person I'm working with right now, like, and they are mentors in that sense. Like, I, I think that's the thing. Like, I, you learn something. Every person that I work with, I'm always like, wow, okay, I didn't see it that way. Like, I look at what they're doing, and I'm like, what? Like, that's amazing. How can mm -hmm. I kind of integrate that into what I'm doing? Um, I just feel like, right now this producing gig that I'm working, this woman that I'm working with, Phoebe, is like, she's incredible. Like she comes from a completely different background, but we're all, we're in the trenches together, like working on these video edits. And you know, it's like, she's amazing. And I'm like inspired by her and I love collaborating with her. Like being able to tag team with somebody is is so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Mindy Cooper, who's um, who I worked with on two off Broadway shows. I love working with her. I just like, you know, just being able to work with someone and just kind of sense like what they mean. Like if they like, you know, it's like we're watching, the sh we're watching a run through and she just literally taps my shoulder and like me knowing like what the note is or whatever. Like I love that feeling of just like being in sync with somebody. Um, and I, I do, I have felt that way with the, with people that I've been fortunate enough to collaborate with um, and, and work under. So almost everybody, I think. <laughs> and you consider them as well, the mentors that have also, uh, made great strides in your career. Um, I want to ask you, and I'm all about celebrating, so I don't want you to mention any names or to give away anything that would give away uh, the answer to what I'm about to ask you. But what was the toughest period that you've gone through um, since you've been mm -hmm. in New York or on the path with your career? Um, and what was the impetus that got you through that period? And I'm just asking for those that may be watching who are going through difficult times mm -hmm. in terms of how you got through a very difficult time uh, with your own career. 
Mm. Gosh. In New York specifically, huh? <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be New York. It could be Chicago. It could be on a cruise ship. Uh, it could be in Europe. It could be anywhere on your yeah. path. Okay, I, I I have a moment in New York. It was it was a tough. It was a tough. Probably, I'm trying to think. It was like April to. It was like five or six months where it was personally I was going through a lot and I was trying to juggle finding an, a new apartment to live in. I was jumping from sublet. I was living out of suitcases. Um, there was all these bills piling up. I had to have like dental so It was like all this stuff that was piling up. And I, I don't know. There was like, just like those moments, like that light of the end, like light at the end of the tunnel moment that when you know, like, okay, when all this like kind of crazy stuff has been thrown mm -hmm. at you and then you have this one moment of fresh air, like take that in mm -hmm. and just take a deep breath and like, okay, like there's one good thing. Okay, like start, start piling on that good energy because I think it's so it is so hard to get bogged down and I I mean listen I think all of us have felt this this past year and a half like oh I God. every day I'm feeling I'm feeling this sense of like am I gonna make it till tomorrow like am I gonna get through my checklist but you have to find those moments even if it's just watching a television show that you've already watched 57 times <laughs> and just like <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to watch anything exactly. new. I don't want to, I don't want to have to think like if I can just like let my brain relax for a second, take that in and enjoy it. You know? Absolutely. So how did you get through all that? That tough period, my friends, my network, my gosh, I'm, sh they listen to me talk so much and therapy too. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that helps, you know? Um, you know, being able to talk and to I know that for most people who are in this business, um, and especially nowadays uh, with social media, um, we are bombarded. We are reminded mm -hmm. uh, daily. I mean, a study came out just this week uh, with Instagram and how it is affecting yeah. young girls uh, with seeing, uh, you know, images of other young girls that they can't ever live up to. Um, seeing the successes of other people. We are constantly bombarded of what we're seeing other people mm -hmm. uh, succeed with or not. How do you uh, navigate with social media in terms of your own work? I, my, well, if you looked at my social media, I have several accounts. I have like my poetry stuff. So when I feel moved, I like just post that on there with beautiful pictures that I take. My personal one, I have really slacked on because, and I only post when I want to, and it's normally pretty pictures mm -hmm. of like my travels. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, navigating, seeing other, I honestly, I love seeing other people's successes. Like that, I don't know that that has really ever, I'm sure I've had like moments of it where it's like, oh, we were up for the same show, but I love seeing other people succeed. Like I love that they're you know, doing they're, amazing I, things. I want to share something with you. I mean, George Akiris uh, from West Side Story, I interviewed him earlier this year. Today was his birthday. I was watching another interview of him today and I congratulated the guy who uh, interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And the guy wrote back and said, I'm a big fan of yours and I'd love to interview you sometime. Oh. And that really, it was like, came out of left field, you know, and all I did was just compliment him. Mm -hmm. It takes very little effort to do things like this. So I think it's very important for all of us to acknowledge those mm -hmm. that we may think of as competition or mm -hmm. in the same field as us. I think it's important for us to do those things. Definitely. I mean, you have, like, you, we're a community. We're all like in this together. Like we have to support each other. I said about that tough time, all the tough times in my life. If I didn't have my community, my network of friends, like what do, what do you have? You know, what do you fall back on? I've always, I've always thought that my friends were just the most important thing to me. And my friendships were so. Well, I want to ask you, how many years have you been in New York now? So I moved here on my birthday, actually, in 2012. Um, how many is that? nine? nine a little over nine what yeah. changes i mean excluding covid which is the biggest change for all <laughs> of us but what, uh, what changes have you seen in the industry since you've come here and what changes have you seen that you absolutely love and what changes have you seen that you're not so crazy about hmm 
That's a good question. Cause I feel like the last couple of years I've, the, the projects that I've been working on have been taking me outside of the city. So I feel like I've actually missed a lot of the, like I've heard mm -hmm. about, you know, some of the changes, but I just, I feel like I've missed a lot of them mm -hmm. because I've been, you know, working elsewhere. Um, which I guess is maybe a good thing because mm -hmm. <laughs> I've away from all the, like madness. I mean, you know, it's, you see on the equity, like, um, you know, discussion boards and stuff. It's like every once in a while, if it pops up in your Facebook and you go down a rabbit hole and you're like, oh my gosh, like I support what's going on here. Probably not. Um, so, yeah. And as far as COVID is concerned, um, you know, a lot of changes have, you know, are taking place. I mean, there are things that have happened this year. And I think also because we have all been placed in the same bubble this past year, um, yeah. I think it's shedding a light on a lot of things with yes. an intensity that we have not really acknowledged before, such as diversity and um, uh, the Me Too movement and other mm -hmm. things that we're really looking at in a way that we probably never would have looked at. 100%. Under the, you know, under the scrutiny that we're looking at. Um, how are these things that are happening, such as diversity and the Me Too movement and everything, how is that affecting the work that you are doing, uh, you know, with, uh, with um, off the lane productions and everything, uh, how is is that making a major difference in terms of the way that you're uh, looking at your work now? One hundred percent. I mean, I I think we've been at off the lane like it, it's you know it's a huge priority for us to make sure that we are reaching out to um, all communities of people that we want to at you know, everyone sees themselves and the mentors that we have um, and the mentees they have. Um, so that's definitely a priority. And it's been interesting, like some of the gigs I worked on the Disney, <clears throat> the Disney upfronts and just seeing their, um, I worked on that for, from January until uh, May of this past year and just seeing like the strides that they're making. And even with some of these, the hair shows that I'm helping and working on stage management, like they're having forums now about, you know, just like, sexual harassment, like things that would never have happened before in the industry. And I think everyone's just finally like, finally listening because we've had this moment of pause. And so everyone's like, no, this is like, we have time, like, unfortunately it's like, it's taken this pause for us to actually deal with a lot of this, um, of what has been happening for years and years and years, um, the inequalities on all levels. So I'm, I'm glad that we've had this time of pause because without it, gosh, like, when does it, when does it stop? Like, when do we actually make the change? Do you think that these are conversations that were being, uh, you know, being uh, had, uh, if you will, for lack, you know, uh, in the shadows uh, or in dark corners that people were having these conversations, but were afraid to come out in the open. Um, and now people are being a, a little bit more emboldened to come out and have these conversations now? I do. I think, I think everyone's been given a platform now. I mean, for me, especially like the, the, the Me Too movement is very personal for me. So finally feel like seeing other people come forward and I support, I'm like shouting them, like, you know, celebrating them for, you know, feel, feel, for feeling comfortable enough to talk about what has happened to them. And before it's like, you know, you just felt like no one was listening. You know, you felt like mm -hmm. your family wasn't listening. You know, it's like the dot, like no one really was listening. and whether people are listening or not, people feel comfortable to say mm -hmm. it and to talk about it. And that's important too. Well, as we, as we move forward and we go through all of this, what are some of the biggest changes that you feel that we still, I mean, what are some of the big hurdles uh, that we still feel that you still feel uh, from your own perspective that we are still facing that we really need to jump over and that you feel that we are very close to getting to, but uh, we're still a long way away from. Yeah, gosh. I mean, it's it's all the same things that we're, we're that have <laughs> that we've been talking about during this past year and a half. It, it's not there yet. You know, none of it's there yet. The the inequality, the the just making it like this is just something that needs to be like a change needs to happen um, because it's. I think certain companies are just 
it's like they're saying it, but they're not backing it up with mm-hmm. actual, or they're like going through the motions, but not um, really truly listening to like what's mm-hmm. like what people are saying. So mm-hmm. everyone is just feeling. We, we just have a lot more work to do. <laughs> no, have you done have you done any traveling over the past year and a half um, uh, during COVID? Yes, I have. Um, the first trip that I took was upstate New York last summer. We drove, we rented a car and drove up and did camping, a camping trip up um, in the Finger Lakes, which was really fun. And then a month later, we went up to the Adirondacks and did some camping. Mm-hmm. And then um, everything's, but I think I've only taken one flight. I had a, a my grandfather passed away, so I had. Oh, I'm sorry to, fly. to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, he was. He's very, very sweet man, and it happened kind of suddenly, but he was also 92, so, like, he's lived oh, a very bless. full life, you know. Um, that was the only flight that I've been on, so I, and I have a gig in a couple of weeks, and I'm flying far. I'm like, oh, gosh, because that one flight, I was like, were, was, were the seats always this close? Like, were we, you know, like, I don't remember being this close to people before. It just feels so weird. Um, but this summer, I took a, a three-week um, a road trip out west to um, Glacier National Park, Yellowstone wow. National Park, Tetons, um, Custer State Park. It was incredible. Um, just, I normally will travel overseas every year. I do a wine tasting trip every year for a couple of weeks. And so I had to, um, to make plans here and we drove out there just, you know, to be extra safe. I mean, we're vaccinated still in our family. We went up with family along the way and just don't know. <laughs> so now that now I want to ask you now that theater is coming back, do you have tickets to anything that's um uh, that I've been looking, I've been looking at tickets um because I'm getting ready to travel um in a couple weeks and work has been crazy, but I've been I've been looking. I was looking at the six lottery, the lottery that they the digital uh-huh. lottery that they announced today. Um, been looking at Chicago tickets. I'm so excited to get back and see some. I know it's it's just it, this feeling that's going on in you. You're, I'm seeing, you know, I'm I'm fe- I have this feeling of uh, of fear. I will be very honest with you, but I also have this fear of jealousy um, yeah. of those yeah. people. <laughs> Do, are you right? feeling the same thing? Those totally. I'm, I, this is my one moment. I'm still liking it and being like, yay, but I'm like, oh, everyone's opening nights. I want to be there. <laughs> I want, you know, the other night when when all the theaters were, uh, the theaters that did open, seeing all those people that, I mean, it must have been pandemonium when Kristen Chenoweth walked on stage uh, like at the Men's Golf, you know, to welcome the audience back yeah. to Wicked. Um, and it's like, oh, yeah. you know, th- this these love fest and how much, you know, we've needed this uh, mm-hmm. coming back. Uh, so, um, and yourself, I mean, you've talked about all the work that you're doing behind the scenes and, you know, uh, on the other side of the aisle. Um, what about yourself? Do you want to get back on the boards again? Get back on the, get back on the You want to perform again yourself? I don't think so. Not right now. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm loving, I'm loving where I am right now being on the other side. Um, I do miss singing. I, mm-hmm. I do miss that. Um, but I really, I like where I'm at. I like, I like, you know, being on the other side and directing and making it all come together. So. Is there a particular okay. role that you would love to play? I think it would be so. My fr- so my first Equity show I did Follies at Chicago Shakes, and um, Phyllis is kind of a, is a fun role in Follies. And Caroline O'Connor was our Phyllis, and she was incredible. And I would have loved to have been that role in that show. And as a director, is there a particular role that you would love to direct? Hmm. Or I mean, a, a production that you would love to direct. I haven't. I I don't have something that like really. I just every project I think is just interesting and, and fun in a different way and a different problem to solve. And so there's nothing that's really like it has to be this or nothing else. 
Okay. Well, as we begin to wind down, I'm going to play a little game with you. Um, and <laughs> this is my little homage uh, to James Lipton and uh, Inside the Actors Studio. Uh, so I've got some fun questions. Hopefully they're fun uh, that I'm going to ask. Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. And um, to whom do you talk most about your career? Probably my boyfriend or my friend Bobby. Is your boyfriend in the business? He is a, um, yes, he's a production designer. Okay. And what is the one thing that most pleases you about uh, what's ahead in terms of your own work? Um, what most pleases me? I just think the, the versatility and what I get to do is really exciting. Okay. What news do you most fear hearing? Mm. Oh gosh. Um, just, I mean, anyone that's hurting, anyone that's in pain, anyone that's gone through something that's really just, where they just feel like they're, they can't come back from it. Um, I empathize with them. Yes, empathize. That's the. Uh, what is your worst addiction? <laughs> worst addiction. Um, worst, huh? Uh, uh, I don't know. Probably anything that has so like things that I like cheat. I'm lactose intolerant. Um, so if I cheat and have something that has dairy in it. That's not good. My stomach okay. hurts. It's so okay. anything that has dairy in it. <laughs> uh, what is the biggest advantage that you have going for you? I, I think adaptability and versatility also. That's great. Uh, what is the boldest thing that you have ever done? Boldest thing. Um... <laughs> but, well, the first thing that comes to mind, I don't think this is the boldest thing, but the first thing that comes to mind is with, with my boyfriend, the first night that we hung out, um, just the two of us, we were hanging out, we were having tea, it was four o'clock in the morning, we were having tea, and I was like, are you going to kiss me already? And I've never done that with anybody. Ah! <laughs> I was like, it's like, well, I want to presume, I'm like, it's four o'clock in the morning, like, you can kiss me, it's okay. <laughs> and should I dare ask? He kissed me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you most want to change in your life? Hmm. Something, yeah, the balance, the work-life balance. That has been on my list for years. Um, haven't quite figured it out yet. If you have mm -hmm. any tips, let me know. <laughs> okay, and my last question to you is, what do you most need to change in your life? Probably the same thing. Okay, don't yeah. go anywhere for a moment. I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, I had a blast. I hope you did too. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, everyone, thank you for being here. Um, I don't take for granted that you could have been anywhere else for the last hour. And the fact that you uh, chose to spend it with us means a lot to me. Um, if you did indeed enjoy tonight's show, um, and this is your first time, please consider subscribing to Richard Skipper Celebrates right here on YouTube. Uh, check out some of the other interviews that I've done and check out the ones that are coming up. We've got some great people waiting in the wings to come up. If you did indeed enjoy tonight's show, please hit the like button, leave a comment right here on YouTube, and please share this with your friends. Um, I also end every show uh, by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else mm -hmm. without expecting anything in return. Uh, go to your Facebook friends list and the seventh name that pops up, reach out with a phone call, not an email message, not a text message, not a private message, but a phone call and let that person know what they mean to you. As my dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat and you never know what someone else is going through right now. Uh, but I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure that you bring a skipper along. Now, <laughs> I'm actually going to leave the screen and I'm going to give you the final word. 
anything oh my that gosh. You, yes, anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about tonight that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish that we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now. I thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world right now. Um, and thank you for all that you do and that you're going to continue to do. Um, you are a true gem. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Richard. This was wonderful. I just, I love that you're doing this, that you're celebrating people. I think it is just, it's fantastic. And I had a great time as well. And I feel lighter because of you, um, because of how you made me dig a little deep and things that I hadn't thought about before and appreciating some of the things that have happened in my life. So I'm grateful for you and thank you. Everyone have a great night.